Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Praise God. We are live and recording. Uh, we're going to do part two of Psalm number 10 tonight. Uh, we will get into that here shortly, but first we're going to go to the throne of grace uh, to present a few people that need uh, need the hand of God to be upon them for healing and also upon uh, the lost. So let's uh, let's go to the throne of grace through Jesus' blood. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful tonight that you're alive and well. And even when we were dead dead to you oh you were moved with compassion you saw you saw us we were lost and then you sent your only begotten son Jesus Christ to bear our sins upon his own body to suffer and die and then you've called all men to repentance turning away from our sins acknowledging them and then trusting in what Jesus did that that precious blood that was spilled on that cross washes away all of our sins and we are then put in a right standing with you so thank you father for sending him to the cross and thank you for raising him up from the dead to prove to us that there is life eternal and father in Christ we have so many things wow so many blessings so many precious promises and father we can't really comprehend the fact that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ our inheritance is eternal wow thank you father you did it all for us so we thank you father for this time around these uh, computers we know that your words gonna go forth that you're the one that sends the sends the Bibles <laughs> I don't even understand how how you do it but wow, the technology we have, anywhere in the world that has access to the computer can get on these Bible studies. And you can send people to them to draw people to yourself. So Father, anoint these Bible studies with your spirit. That everything that is said would truly be from the spirit that you have sent forth. And Father, we want you to know that we love you and we thank you for loving us first. And we, we know that there's so many that, uh, well, there's, wow, there's like nine or ten people that have cancer that we've been praying for that really need a, a healing touch in a, in a way that only you can do. So we come and name them by name and ask that your spirit would go through their bodies and burn up every single cancer cell in their body that you would receive the glory from it. Father, we pray for Wanda, Suze, Susan, uh Rose, Ashley, Paul, Kathy, Letty, Lois, Tanya, Joe Seegers, Al Bowman, and Roddy. Father, all of them. We want to hear a testimony of how the, they've received a miracle in their life. Because the power of prayer and the power of Jesus' name is more powerful than any disease that there is. So we just simply ask that you would touch them. Father, we pray that you would touch my wife, Phyllis. Father, her neck is kind of bound up right now, and she needs some relief, but you're already aware of that. And we just pray that your spirit would come upon her now, and that in Jesus' name you would touch. You already know exactly what needs to happen, and we just simply pray. We're trusting in you. Father, we do pray for... Uh, John Woods, we know that uh, he had some serious surgery uh, this past week. We just pray that complete healing would come to him. Bill Stratton is still in need of a, of a miracle in his life. Regina with her uh, health issues, but more importantly, Father, you're going to glorify yourself through that too. And we just pray that every decision that she's got to be making here pretty soon, and that even now that you would move upon her, Give her wisdom to know exactly where you would have her to go and let her have the strength and the faith to follow what you are leading her to do. We pray for Lisa. We pray for Bobby and his two boys, uh, Jeremy and Nathan. Again, Father, that your will and purpose will be accomplished in their life, that you would strengthen them. 
And Father, we're so thankful tonight that Christy and Homer and uh, Bobby and Mandy were able to sing at a revival service, and it appears that, that your spirit was there and moving. And we rejoice, and we thank you and praise you for that. And we do pray that you would continue to anoint them as they sing and and deliver a message through music and song. It's, it's so powerful. So, Father, we uh, do want to pray probably the most important of all prayer requests is that your spirit would come upon our lost loved ones those that are in darkness that we know and love we know that you're moving upon them because that's who you are that's what you do and we just pray that father that you would press them down so low in their own sin and wretchedness until they see that the only way out and the only way to get peace and joy in our heart is to turn to Jesus and that they would do so. Help us to be a light to them, to show them the cross, to show them the resurrection, to show them that Jesus does live because he lives within our heart. Father, we do pray for uh, the Raven family. We know that uh, the funeral service for, for him is going to be uh, uh, Thursday, and we just pray your spirit upon that family that you would give comfort you know exactly what needs to be said and i pray your spirit upon the ministers that's going to be ministering the word and that the gospel would be preached and that that people that are lost in that family might see the glory of jesus even through tragedy father you can shine the light of jesus upon many hearts so we just lift that situation to you and now father we want you to come and share with us from your word, through your spirit, what we need to know tonight about Psalm 10 and about your character and who you are. And we know that it's thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't matter if we believe it or not. Everything that you say in your word is going to come to pass, just as you have said it. So you come now, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Very good. Psalm number, I think I said Psalm 9. Hmm, no, we're in Psalm 10. I'm sorry. If I made that mistake, uh, sorry. Psalm 10. This is part 2 of Psalm 10. We went through the first uh, 12 verses last week. And, uh, wow, I don't even know how to begin to... Uh, <laughs> To summarize last week's uh, Bible study, but uh, what we talked about, uh, the psalmist said that the Lord seemed to be far off, and uh, he was asking questions. You know, why do why do you God hide in times of trouble? The wicked and their pride persecutes the poor. Well, where are you, Lord? Why 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 are you know? It seems like the Lord is far off and doesn't seem to really care. And then he, you know, as he was talking in verse 3, he said, For the wicked boast in their heart's desire. And they bless, the wicked bless the greedy and renounce the Lord. And we went into uh, a discussion of uh, Romans 1, uh, which talks about uh, the depravity where God will give you over to your heart's desire if you choose not to... Uh, Trust him and you choose not to follow him in the ways of righteousness. Well, he will give you over to your own wretchedness and your own heart. Uh, Paul the Apostle, we uh, talked about uh, 2 Timothy 3, where it would be terrible in the times just before Christ's return because just as Psalm 10 said, uh, Paul says also that in times just before Christ, that this thing would increase, that wickedness would increase, uh, people would be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive. Uh, it goes through a whole list, and it says that they would have a form of godliness, right? They would have a form of Christianity, but they actually deny the power. And Paul says, uh, don't even have anything to do with them. So we discussed that, and we discussed even further uh, the wickedness. In uh, verses 4 through 7, we talked about the tongue. And boy, that was, a, that was a hot one. I mean, wow. 
And we talked about James 3 where James tells us that, you know, the tongue is the smallest part of the body, but yet it, it makes big, great boasts. And uh, as it's a world of iniquity. It's a world of sin. It's a world of evil among the parts of the body, you know, the tongue. And mankind can tame all kinds of animals, but he himself cannot tame his own tongue. Uh, and we talked about uh, the fact that uh, fire, you know, the fires of hell, that the tongue is actually set on fire by hell. Uh, wow, that's, it's hard to even fathom. You know, in other words, we can, uh, listen closely, we can bless God and then curse our brother. Wow, that should never be. Can fresh water and <laughs> uh, salt water come from the same spring? Of course not. And that's wicked, right? The tongue leads to evil. It's wicked. If it's not tamed under the power of Jesus Christ, wow. And it's, uh, we summed up that portion of Scripture by talking about the wisdom that comes through humility, which brought us into uh, pretty much verses 8 through 11 of Psalm uh, 10. And we talked about the fact that, uh, you know, <laughs> that the wicked always lurk in secret places just like the devil you know what's the devil do he lurks around seeking whom he may devour he runs back and forth like a roaring lion right and of course the psalmist brings that point out well the wicked act just like their father the devil right uh, and this you know what is so profound about why would this be pertinent to us today you may ask well you know what the same can be said for many Christians today we talked about this and how it can be that they can say with their mouth that they love Jesus and then live wicked lives in other words many Christians say this and if you listen closely uh, you will recognize it uh, maybe you have fell into this trap before and if you have I pray that you would repent that well, God will forgive us, so let us do what we feel is right or feel is good, right? It's okay to go ahead because God will forgive us anyway. Well, that's a philosophy that comes from the wickedness of man's heart. That is not uh, biblical Christianity, to say the least. So we discussed that. And then we talked about verse 12, which was very powerful because... The psalmist is saying, Arise, O Lord, arise, O God, and lift up your hand, and do not forget the humble. And we discussed again from James chapter 4 about humility, that God gives, what, more grace because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And, wow, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up uh, let's not wait for God to humble us because wow that is pretty rough okay let us humble ourselves before the Lord and then he will lift us up and now we're going to pick up with our Bible study text which is Psalm 10 starting verse 13 I will read the rest of the uh, of the psalm, starting in verse 13. Listen again, the inspired word of the living God, and may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the expounding of his word. So why do the wicked renounce God? It's a good question. He has said in his heart, you will not require an account, but you have seen, for you, God, observe trouble and grief. To repay it by your hand, the helpless commit himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. Wow. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. 
Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. You know, I was reading through that. Mm. Did you hear what the Word of God said? So let's answer these questions. You know, verse 13, the psalmist says, Why do the wicked renounce God? In other words, this is what they say in their heart. I will not be required to give an account. In other words, God doesn't exist. That's only a figment of Christian's imagination, right? Because the Bible says only a fool says in their heart that there is no God. So why do the wicked renounce God? Because they don't think they will have to give an account to him. And you know what's astounding about this? And, you know, I've talked to atheists and, wow, I just scratch my head every single time. Because they really do not believe that there's a God. And the question that always that always pops up in my infinite mind here, or my finite mind about an infinite God, is that uh, how can you be hateful, angry, and hostile to a God that you says don't exist? Is that some kind of intellectual dishonesty or something there? <clears throat> right? Why do the atheists hate God whom they say does not exist? If they really don't believe he exists, then why don't they just do whatever? But no, they hate him. They attack him. They renounce him. So why do the wicked do that? You know, and I want to say something. We always got to follow the Spirit's leading. Do you realize... And I, I don't know how many uh, that are going to be watching this have children or grandchildren. But do you realize that in America, United States of America, it has been pounded and brain they are brainwashing our children and grandchildren. They have been for how many decades now that there is no God, right? That we evolved from monkeys. That somehow all this matter just came together and boom, bang. We're here. There is no God. There is no accountability. There is no sin. There is no wickedness. We're just here. We eat. We drink. We marry. Da 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 da. We party, and tomorrow we die, and that's it. Well, that's a pitiful existence, right? So the question is, why do the wicked renounce God? Because they don't think that they'll have to give an account. Well, that makes a lot of sense. If you look at America today, if you look at the way people run around and they do wickedly, they act like they're not going to have to give an account. Why would, why would they care what they did if they don't believe that there's a God and they don't believe that they're going to give an account? Hello. But you know what? Here's a revelation, and I'm sure that uh, everybody that I know everybody that's watching live right now uh, for sure knows this. But uh, in case there's somebody that's going to be watching this that hadn't had this revelation yet, well, listen up. Uh, God exists, and you will give an account for your life, right? He will hold you accountable, right? Whether you believe that or not. Oh, that's a revelation. It's not dependent on whether you believe that there's a God or not, because God does exist. See, there's a lot of people that think, well, I don't believe that I will have to, so therefore I won't have to. Well, that's hogwash, <laughs> right? And I don't think God really uh, is up there wringing his hands, oh, I hope they believe in me. No. You either believe in me because I have made myself known, or you will perish in your sins. And it doesn't matter if you believe it or not, I do exist. I will hold you accountable because I have lavished my love upon you. I have lavished my grace upon you. Wow. And I will acquire you. I will require an account from you. Okay.
Let's go to a couple cross references to verse 13. First one, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Wow, this is, that's a powerful book, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, uh, there's one verse that I want to look at. You can go back and read the uh, entire chapter. You know, the preacher Solomon is given wisdom that, wow, it's hard to even fathom. But he makes a statement. And again, it doesn't really matter if you believe it or not. It's God's word. He does exist, and he will hold you accountable. Because it says in Ecclesiastes 12, 14, because we as believers, we believe in the word of God. God said it. That settles it, whether you believe it or not. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret, every secret thing, whether it is good or good. Or evil. Now we as believers in Christ, we know that the only good thing in us is Jesus in us, right? Right? But God is still going to hold everyone accountable. We know that, uh, wow, that all of our judgment has been placed upon Jesus. But did you know that even in Christ, even trusting in Christ, even abiding in Christ, even having Christ in us, we still will have to give an account. It's not a judgment concerning heaven or hell, because that's already been established when you repent of your sins and trust in Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, and it's not a judgment of sin, because that... Sin has already been paid and already been blotted out. The sin in our lives have been blotted out by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. But we will still have to give an account for what we have done in the body, in Christ, whether it's good or bad. Oh, don't believe me. Believe 2 Corinthians 5.10. That's our second cross reference. And remember... Uh, we're discussing Psalm 10, verse 13. So why do the wicked renounce God? For he says in his heart, I will not require an account. In other words, God is not going to require an account because I don't believe in God and whatever. Well, you know, did you even know that Christians can have that attitude as well? They go about living wicked and sinful lives in the name of Jesus and they're acting as if they won't have to give an account one day. Did you you know you know that? Um, we know that. Isn't it true that in the name of Jesus we can curse people to hell? In the name of Jesus, people can there can be wicked sinners that turn to Jesus and they will stumble over us because we're trying to hold them away from Jesus. Yeah, it happens all the time. We do it with our tongue. A lot of Christians do it with their tongue. But in 2 Corinthians 5.10, the New Testament, the New Covenant, the covenant of grace, right? Paul the Apostle speaking to the church, speaking to Christians. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we, those that are in Christ, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So guess what? We're held accountable too. Even in Christ, we are held accountable. Now again, it's not a judgment of heaven or hell or of sin because sin has already been paid for on the bloody cross of Christ. It's things done while you were in Christ, whether good or bad. He doesn't use the word evil there, does he? Hmm. Well, let's just put it to you this way. If you're in Christ, you're going to flee from evil. You're going to flee from wickedness. And I don't give a rip what you think about the Bible or what you think about what is being said in the Word of God. The bottom line is, the solid foundation of God stands firm that those who name the name of Christ will depart from evil. Oh, you think, oh, well, where is that found? Well, let me look it up for you, because it's a, it's a very powerful truth. 
It's uh, found in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.19. This was a new one. I wasn't even thinking about this. The Spirit just moved upon her because I guess we need to hear it. 2 Timothy 2.19. Again, the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul. Because Christians, there's a lot of Christians that we know, we probably know some of them, and God forbid if any of us are Christians and we're still living in iniquity with no regard for sin and no regard for Christ. and Because, wow. And you know, I'm just going to take a little side rabbit trail. Do you know there's a lot of teaching and preaching out there that Wow, when we're in Christ, there is no need of repentance anymore. All you have to do is repent from belief or from non-belief to belief. That's the only repentance God requires. Really? Well, if you believe that, then you need to repent. Hello? I'll say it again. That's wickedness. You need to repent of that philosophy. Because I want to ask you a question. It's a very simple question. When do Christians... Stop turning away from wickedness. So we're going to go ahead and continue to lie, cheat, steal, fornicate, and do all the manner of wickedness that we want because we're in Christ, hallelujah, and he'll forgive us anyway. Well, that's the philosophy that a lot of Christians have today. That Well, I've already gave my life to Jesus. You know, I've already repented once. I, I was a non-believer. Now I'm a believer, and that's it. That's all that's required of me. Really. Wow, there is bukus of scripture, but one particular one, Second Timothy two nineteen. You might want to mark that one down. I don't know if you mark your Bibles or whatever. You might want to put this one from your head to your heart. This is a powerful one. Verse nineteen, Second Timothy two. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. That means it's going to stand forever because his word abides forever. And it has this seal. And this is the seal or the inscription that's on that seal, the solid foundation of God stands. The Lord knows who are his. No doubt about it. No question about it. If you are in Christ, he knows you. Right? He knows you by name. No question. And not only, all right, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So if you're saying that you're a Christian, a follower of Christ, guess what? You best be departing from iniquity. That means daily depart from iniquity. Turn from iniquity. When does that stop? Am I preaching to the choir? Probably am, but hello. We will never stop departing from iniquity. If we do, then wow, we're going to be trampling under our feet the blood of Jesus. Because if we continue in sin, after we've come to the knowledge of the truth, wow. So what does this have to do with our Bible study? It has everything to do with it because Psalm 10 verse 13 says, Why do the wicked renounce God? Well, they hate God. They don't believe they're going to have to give an account. Well, right? Well, you know what? Christians can also have that same philosophy and not even be aware of it. Oof. I think another thing to say, is it possible for the wicked, I mean, they're lost in their sins, right? I was once lost in my sins, too. Is it possible that we could be so lost that we would actually love our sins more than we love God. We don't want to give them up. Well, we just heard we will be required to give an account. Better to be in Christ and be at the judgment seat of Christ, right? And have him take our punishment, him take our sins away, than to remain in our sins and wait to be judged at the great white throne of judgment. So, we go on. Psalm 10, verse 14. Again, we're back at our uh, Bible study text. Psalm 10, verse 14. 
Now listen closely. This uh, I don't even know. I don't even know how to do this Bible study. I'll be quite honest with you. Other than wow, bringing in other Bible verses to help us out. In verse fourteen it says, "But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand." In other words, the Lord God sees everything, and He observes trouble and grief to repay it by his own hand. <clears throat> the helpless commits himself to you. Uh, yeah. Have you ever thought about this? Sometimes when we feel helpless, that's a good thing. Because most of the time when we feel helpless, that's when we run to God. I mean, we should run to God all the time. But a lot of times, uh, as the psalmist says there in verse 14, the helpless commits himself to you. And God is the helper of the fatherless. And you know, there's two, uh, there's two themes uh, in the Bible that over and over and over, Old Testament and New Testament, God has very much in his heart... Um, a special, I mean, I, I can't say this because, wow, it's, it's so hard because I don't want to, I don't want to say that I know the heart of God, but if you study the Old Testament and New Testament and you read, you will find where God all the time brings up the fatherless and the widows, right? All through the Old Testament and New Testament, Father, uh, fatherless, that's orphans and widows, because God is the helper of fatherless and widows because they need help. So the first part of verse 14, God sees all things. He observes trouble and grief to repay it. Hmm. You know, this kind of reminds me of uh, what Paul taught in Romans chapter 12. And boy, this is some good, clear teaching right here now. Romans chapter 12. Verses 19 through 21. This is such an awesome practical teaching. <laughs> so simple, but yet so profound. Romans 12, starting verse 19. Again, Paul the Apostle, speaking under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talking to the church, to Christians. Do not take revenge, my friends. We like, to, we like to avenge, right? We like to take revenge. <laughs> but we are not to do that. But leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, saith the Lord. Oh. it's exactly what the psalmist said there in Psalm 10. On the contrary. And boy, I'll be honest with you. There's so many practical teachings in the Bible. If Christians would just obey little teachings it would make a vast difference in this world listen to this profound teaching this is exclusively for those in Christ because wow without Christ there ain't none of us can do this if your enemy is hungry feed him you know what in the name of Jesus we can actually uh, starve our enemies <laughs> you know it's true. But in Christ, you know what? Jesus said to love your enemies and pray for them that persecute you. Paul says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Wow. If we would practice that in the church, can you imagine? And doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. In other words, holy conviction will come upon them. Right? Did you know that even in the body of Christ, there's actually people that go at it, man, every week. Man, they just go at it. They go at it. They fight and they argue and they bicker and they... If that one verse right there, verse 20, would be put into practice by either or by one of them... If just hunger, if they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them a drink. In other words, be kind to them. Be compassionate to them. 
right? And so doing, you will heap burning coals on it. In other words, it will bring holy conviction down upon them. That's right. It will transform a church. It will transform a house, a home. It will transform a local community. It will transform a nation. If that one verse was put into practice. And do not overcome, listen to this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So there's practical uh, teaching right there in Psalm 10, verse 14. Wow. Very much so. The Lord sees all. He is the avenger. We don't repay, right? We allow room for God's wrath. That's exactly right. Now, uh, also went to uh, Peter. Another cross-reference is 1 Peter chapter 4. Again, these are very practical uh, verses to really ponder, to study, and to put into practice. 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter the Apostle speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, he also writes to Christians, verse 12, 1 Peter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Jesus Christ suffered immensely, right? And those that follow after Christ are also going to suffer. You know, it's probably an indication sometimes if you look at how much uh, people are rejecting you. You know, they rejected Jesus. But anyway, if you are insulted, verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Jesus, you are blessed. For the spirit of, listen, to this, the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. Whoa. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Wow. You know, I was just... The Spirit was just reminding me of a story in the book of Acts. <laughs> you know, Peter and John, you know, they went to the temple as a custom. They went to the temple to, you know, pray and whatnot. And there was a, well, anyway, there was somebody there that was asking for alms, asking, begging for for mercy, basically. Uh, so anyway, and there was a fellow that got healed, you know. And the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of Israel didn't like what was going on. They were doing it in the name of Jesus. So they arrested them, they flogged them, and they told him, uh, don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. So basically they got rods and they whipped them severely, flogged them, right? And when they went back to the church to report what had just happened... They didn't whine and cry, oh, look at what they're doing to me. They rejoiced. And they said, we have been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. <laughs> That's powerful stuff right there now. So if we suffer as a Christian, we don't need to be ashamed. We need to praise God that we bear that name, that we bear the name Christ, right? Christian, Christ. Christ like for it is time now listen closely don't don't forget this verse 17 for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God and if it begins with us what will the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God and in fact in verse 18 if it is hard for the righteous to be saved what will the become of the ungodly and the sinner You know why it's hard for even the righteous to be saved? Pride. It really is pride. Because nobody's going to be saved unless they humble themselves before the Lord. Lay themselves down. You know? Cry out for mercy. 
If it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will be the outcome of the ungodly and the sinner? But listen to this now, verse 19. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Well, you need a word, Christian? I'll give you a word real quick. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. You always do what is right. You always do what is good. Right? You know, there's times in our Christian walk when, you know, we might pray about something, you know, about a decision or something in our life, and, and we just don't have a clear leading whether, you know, it's not God's fault. You know, there might be so many things going on in your head. There's so many things going on in your life, and you just don't know what to do. Well, the Bible tells us very plainly what to do. Commit yourselves to your faithful creator and continue to do good. In other words, no matter what is happening in your life, no matter what the suffering is, no matter what the circumstance is, do what is right. Right? Do what's good. Not what you think is good, but do what's good. Because we all know what good and evil is. So do the right thing, even if it's hard. Because sometimes doing the right thing is the hardest thing to do. Now, back to our Bible study text real quickly, verse 15 through 18. This is uh, such a powerful uh, teaching. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. You know, the psalmist is crying out to God. It's like a prayer. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. Woo! Press him down so far in his own wickedness that he has no air to even breathe. Press him down, Lord. That's what he's saying. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. In other words, keep pressing him down and pressing him down until that wickedness is seized so wallowed in his own wickedness that he cries out for mercy and then he will find none because he will cry out to the Lord. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. The Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You know, how does the, why does the Bible say in verse 17 that the Lord has heard the desire of the humble? Because the humble, those that are broken in their heart, that are humble before the Lord, their desire, you know what's their desire? Is to please the Lord. Because they can't do it by themselves anymore. They can't do it alone. Because the Lord will prepare their heart and the Lord will cause his ear to hear them. Jesus uh, told a parable, told a story about this very thing. About a religious leader, a Pharisee, and a dirty, rotten sinner, a tax collector, right? Who stole extras for himself. Well, they both went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee, the religious leader... Put himself up and started praying to himself, praying about himself, saying that, well, God, I did this for you, and, and I tithe, and, and I'm glad I'm not like the other men, and I'm glad I'm not like that guy over there. You know, self-righteous prayer, confidence in his own flesh. Then the poor old sinner, he couldn't even lift his head up to heaven. And I've often thought to myself, you know, that tax collector, he probably heard what that religious leader was saying about him. And he probably didn't disagree with him. He knew he was a dirty, rotten sinner. He couldn't even lift up his head. And his heart was broken. His heart was humble. And he simply cried out to God, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Woo! Jesus said that man went home justified. All right? Because God will exalt the humble in heart. He will hear their cry. And in verse 18... To do justice to the fatherless, again, the, the orphans, right? He will do justice for the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Because you know what man does? You know what mankind does? It takes advantage of widows and orphans. It takes advantage of people that are oppressed. Have you seen the welfare system in America? That's a pretty good example, I would think. Right? Well, you know, uh, 
there's one cross reference that I want to bring up as a way to close this Bible study and it's a powerful one too it's found in Isaiah the prophet Isaiah chapter 11 and this is speaking about Jesus if you've done any Bible studies um, I know a few of you watching right now uh, have been going through the Camden Bible study, and we talked about the seven spirits of God, as it's mentioned in Revelation, uh, in uh, particularly Revelation chapter 1. The seven spirits of God, well, the seven spirits of God are defined in Isaiah 11. And this is a cross-reference to close our Bible study of Psalm 10 about the Lord and what he does. And it has to, it really sums up the whole uh, Psalm 10 but in Isaiah 11 it says this verse 1 a shoe will come up from the stump of Jesse from his roots a branch will bear fruit alright simply it's referring to Jesus because he come up from the lineage of King David uh, which was the from the lineage of Jesse okay the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him Okay, you got the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Wisdom, the Spirit of Understanding, the Spirit of Counsel, the Spirit of Power, the Spirit of Knowledge, the Spirit and the Fear of the Lord, right? The seven Spirits of God all rest upon one person, Jesus Christ. And He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what He sees with His eyes or decide by what He hears with His ears. Because he only does what his father instructed him to do, right? But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Jesus will do that? He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Well, what's the rod of his mouth? I'll tell you what the rod of his mouth is. It's called the word of God. It's a double-edged sword. The rod of his mouth. And it says, now listen closely, this is the Jesus. And there's so many people today that has some perverted Jesus that they claim that they love and cherish and abide in. Well, that wouldn't do this. But yet, this is the true Jesus of the Bible. That he, listen, that with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. And I'm telling you, that is some serious business. And if you've listened to any of this psalm, part one and part two, about the wickedness, I'll tell you what, you know what wickedness is. It's anything that's brought misery and pain and suffering in your life. It's because of your sin or sin of somebody else. It's wickedness. You know what wickedness is. Don't deny it. You know what evil is. Right? And you better be warned that Jesus is going to breathe on you with his lips and it's going to slay you. He has no choice. He doesn't want to do it. He wants to save you. He wants to wash your sins away. But if you reject him and you will not humble yourself before him, he has no choice. And righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Whoa. Now that is the truth. So, how shall we conclude? The way we always conclude. Every Bible study we conclude with the truth of the gospel. What is the gospel? What's the good news? What is Christianity all about? Who is this Jesus? What is he all about? Well, it's very simple. Jesus is the sinless Son of God that came to this earth to be like one of us. He never committed any sins, but he came to die for sinners, you and I. We have all committed sins. We've all lied. And if you say you haven't lied, you just did. All right? If you've committed one sin, you need somebody to pay the penalty for that sin. And all of us is told a lie, right? So, the sinless Son of God came to the earth 
to die upon a cross to take the penalty for your sin and mine and the sins of the whole world. He suffered. His blood was spilt. That if you would just simply acknowledge that you've sinned, acknowledge and agree with God that you've sinned, turn away from it, and trust that Jesus did do that, that he did actually die on the cross, and that his blood was spilt to wash away your sins, and that he was raised from the dead, by the simple act of trusting in what Jesus did, you are guaranteed eternal life. Right? Peace, joy, and eternal bliss that is unimaginable by the simple act of what Jesus did, by simply trusting, humbling yourself, surrendering yourself to him. If you haven't done that, you better do it now. Time is running out. You ain't. You may not have another chance. And if you have done that already, <laughs> well then say hallelujah, praise God, because that, my friends, is the gospel of salvation. That's what this Bible study is all about. That's what the whole word of God is all about. It's all about the righteous, holy God and his wrath that's coming upon the wickedness. And that's why we have to flee to the cross of Christ to be saved and spared from the wrath that has come. Thank you all for coming. Lord bless you all. I hope and pray that I will see some of you tomorrow night. And some of you I will see back here Thursday. Lord bless each and every one of you.